Oh wait, 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 wait! I almost forgot. <laughs> this is this is the face reveal video. Look, look! You've been thinking that this is what I look like the whole time. You guys have been wrong. I, I've tricked you. I fooled you. Really, really. Hold on. Let me pull my earbuds out. I'm not prepared. Okay, I I, I look like this. <laughs> like I can never think of anything special to do for like my five hundred thousand or one hundred or. 300,000 subscribers stuff. I never do anything for them. And I just, I don't know. I just, I was just being goofy. There was really nothing to it. We're going to take the first question today. Um, I'm Pastor Mike Winger. I'm here to try to help you to learn to think biblically about everything. doesn't mean I have all the answers. Uh, really, as, as you, if those of you who've watched my content know, it, it doesn't mean that I'm giving you all the perfect answers, although I'm going to try to give you the best answers I can. It means that you're on the journey that I'm on, which is to try to just get in the process of learning to think about things through the lens of specific statements and teachings in scripture, so you can have a biblical worldview and a biblical mindset. First question we have today comes from Don Miguelio, who says, what does it mean that we will reign with Christ in heaven? What will, uh, what use will there be for any kind of authority in a sinless universe where our righteousness and wisdom are perfect? So there's like a couple different questions there. I'm going to try to answer all of, the, all of them here. So um, in Revelation 3.21, let's, let's put this on your screen here. Revelation 3.21, it does talk about this. Jesus says, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So the first thing we'll learn about this sort of future eternal reigning or ruling royalty of the universe is that we have it by virtue of our connection with Jesus. Like that, that's how I have this kind of future, you know, experience. It's, it's that I am inheriting, being being a, a son and daughter of God, being a brother of Christ, being a co-heir with Jesus, these are all connected to the fact that I will then reign with Christ, rule and reign with Christ. So my intimate connection with Jesus gives me a relationship with the new creation where I'm in, and you are, if, if, if we overcome, if we indeed hold on, hold fast to the faith that we experience that. Um, it's kind of like Genesis, and some people will treat like the new creation as though it's sort of a um, Garden of Eden restored, but I think it's better than that. So let me just say, um, there's the Garden of Eden element. Genesis 1, 26, when God says, you know, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion, dominion, that's rulership, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God made man to have this sort of authority and rulership over the earth. But the future reigning with Christ is bigger and broader. It's more than that. Yes, it's restored right relationship of mankind with earth and the creatures of earth, but it's it's also inheriting all of creation, including even angels, like ruling over angels. Um, so another verse that talks about this is Matthew 19, verse 27 and 28, and we'll read uh, to 30, I guess. So then Peter said in reply, talking to Jesus, Peter says, see, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world, in the new world, so that's talking about the new creation, that that is the permanent eternal situation. When the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who follow me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. This seems to imply the apostle specifically being in, in this kind of position. And um, what's interesting about that is that we, we all share in the airship of Christ, we all rule the universe but in relation to other humans, there is going to be different degrees of authority that different people have, having authority in, to some extent over other people um, that are in the kingdom. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters, everyone, not just uh, some, or father or mother or children or lands for my namesake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So... Let me th then try to tackle some of your some of your thoughts here, at least from my opinion, Don Miguelo, uh, Miguelo, Miguelio. Sorry. Uh, okay, so I'll just call you Don. <laughs> um, at any rate, your question is: Why is there authority in a sinless universe? Like, why is there any kind of authority in a universe where there's no sin? That's a good question. I think the the answer is going to be simply to say we have to realize that authority doesn't only exist because of sin. Certainly, God would be in authority over us in that in that in that eternal and glorious and sinless universe, but that's not because we're sinning. So, authority isn't doesn't only exist to stop sin, although that's one of its functions and an important function in our society. It can be good 
just on its own. It can just demonstrate goods and have qualities, value just for being authority in and of itself. It demonstrates things that are inherently good like submission, trust, care, leadership, um, etc. All these sorts of things that can happen in the environment where, where someone has authority and someone else is yielding. And in a sinless universe, it'll be a beautiful thing. It'll be a wonderful thing. So I think that that's a positive thing. Submission, we often in our sort of, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess at why, our westernized and very self-centered and sometimes narcissistic view of reality that we have in our culture today, we, we tend to think of submission as inherently bad. Um, and the Bible seems to imply it's inherently good. And so if submission's inherently good, as long as you're submitting in, in the right ways to the right people and all that, then that means that the authority is also inherently good. So this is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Also, um, you could ask, why is there going to be authority? And you, you did ask this. Uh, when our righteousness and wisdom are perfect. That is, why is anybody going to have authority over me when I would have all the great ideas they would have, right? Like we're all in agreement might be one way of putting it. I'm not sure if we're all going to be totally in agreement. If having the the kind of wisdom and the knowledge that we have, if that means, we'll, I mean, we'll be in agreement about righteousness, we'll be in agreement about goodness, but will we be in agreement about every single aspect of, of reality? I don't know about that, um, but I'll say this, whether we are or not, uh, maybe it's because organization requires authority. Organization itself, just to organize groups of people for good things requires someone to be organizing them or leading them, and that can be a good thing in and of itself. And unless everybody's a robot who just has a set of instructions and they all just do them without any sort of leader or organizer. Um, also, we we rule over more than just each other in the new creation. We rule over all of creation, including angels and all this sort of thing. So I think that um, I have some questions that linger, lots of questions that linger about eternal life and about the, the eternal realm and what will our bodies be like and what will that be like. I don't think of it as being a spaceless, distant sort of like in outer space, I'm sort of hanging out there. I think of it as being a more grounded experience, um, uh, heaven meets earth kind of thing. And I also wonder about the millennium. Okay, so I'm pre-millennial. Maybe I'll change my mind one day on that, but I'm pre-millennial. I think the thousand year reign of Christ is a future reality that comes before the new creation. And there's gonna be a ruling over the nations that happens during that as well. And so there's gonna be an element of ruling there that I wonder what scriptures might be referring to that specifically and not something else even further distant in the ultimate new creation. So yeah, um, there's more you guys can look into for homework. I'll point you to Matthew 25 before we go to question number two. Matthew 25 talks about the parable of the talents. And this is where Jesus, basically I'll summarize, he gives like a, a gift of, or it's just not really a gift, more like a responsibility of a large sum of money, this, 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 uh, this business owner in the parable to a group of different people. And so he gives he gives a, a small amount of talents to one guy, a medium amount to someone else, and a large amount to someone else. And then later he comes back. And basically, sh long story short, the ones who were very faithful and they invested and they made good use of what they were given, they inherited rulership over much in the future. And this is a parable connected to our eternal future. So not only will you inherit heaven, but if you're faithful with the things that God has given you, if you serve well in this life, and only the Lord will test that, whether that's true or not of me or of you, then there will be, it seems, a greater responsibility in the heavenly kingdom related to that. All right, so we're going to go to question number two. This question comes from Bryce Johnson, who asks, um, hey, Pastor Mike, hope you're well. Um, I'm, I'm getting I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm, I'm still stuck in the, in the grip of, I guess, what is long COVID, and uh, there's not... Um, there's not much to be done except to try to manage how much activity I do. If, if I overdo it, it like throws me out for like days. And so I'll get over it over time. I'm just, my productivity is really dismal <laughs> at the moment. Um, anyway, you brought it up. So I thought I'd mention that to you. I do, however, have my next Women in Ministry video coming out though. And it's already recorded. I've already edited. I just need to double check a couple things. And I'll probably put it up within the next two days. So maybe Sunday, I'll, I'll put it up online. And you guys can check that out. It's on the First Corinthians 14 passage, which deals with um, women be silent in the church. It's shameful for, for a woman to speak in church. Verses that taken out of context are hugely inflammatory, but even which understood in context are still going to be irritating people, um, especially if they don't have a complementary view of things. Okay, well, we'll dig, dig into all that stuff um, when that video comes out on, I think, Sunday, probably. So, Bryce, you say... Um, are there any non-Calvinist systematic theology books you recommend? Thank you for all you do. 
here's the thing, Bryce, and I got to be super straight with you. My study of, of, of theology now doesn't, doesn't flow from any one resource. And so I'm not that familiar with one resource that I could in modern times point you to. So what happened when I was younger is I would, we would look at say Thiessen's um, theology book. Okay. You can, and you could look it up, go find Thiessen. That's what we studied when I was in my school of ministry. And I found it very helpful. Um, at a very, at an even much younger age, it was uh, the foundations of Pentecostal theology book. Although I find that as I've grown in my own understanding of things, I look back at some of those resources, uh, for instance, the foundations of Pentecostal theology. And I look at it and I go, I don't know if I would just sort of blanketly recommend this to people. You know, it has a lot of value, but is it, if someone goes, give me one, Mike, that I can just really trust, I feel way too intimidated to, to offer you that. And my current studies, I don't just look at one systematic theology book. Like you could go, oh, Wayne Grudem's got it. And you just recently edited a new one. You could recommend that. Yeah, but I, have I really studied through Wayne Grudem's book to be able to recommend it? I feel hesitant to suggest one. Uh, because you might take whatever respect or trust you have for me and think that me suggesting this book is an endorsement when I haven't done the homework to be able to endorse it. doesn't mean it's bad. So when it comes to those kinds of book recommendations, in my own studies, I don't I do not do that. What I'll do is if I pick a, a doctrinal topic, I might look at one entry in a systematic theology book here, the same issue in that book here, in that book here, in that book here. That doesn't give me a great knowledge of each of those books as a whole because I'm just studying that one topic. Anyway, this is why I can't offer too many good recommendations for you on that. I apologize. Um, yeah, when it comes to book recommendations, I tend to be very um, hesitant for that reason. Eric Sten, uh, Stensred says, in Lord of the Rings, uh, good question already, I can tell you, <laughs> would you consider the hair length too long for some characters such as Aragorn or Legolas? How do I apply 1 Corinthians 11 when designing characters for my own projects? Um, so this was a, a challenging thing for me. Th for those of you who watched my, my video on hair coverings, first off, congratulations. Uh, that's a long time to watch the whole video. Um, it, it, it's a fraction of the time it took to make it though. But the, um, but one of the conclusions I had there that I didn't enjoy, I didn't like, <laughs> to be honest with you, but I feel is what scripture seems to clearly be teaching, um, in my opinion, is that hair length does matter as a transcendent principle that's not dependent on culture. Now, this immediately brings up a lot of questions. And because that video is so long, I don't deal with all those questions in detail because the video is about everything. It's not about just one thing. But let me just say a few things about it since you bring it up in your question, Bryce. Uh, not Bryce, uh, Eric. So, Eric, um, here's a few principles, I, I, I think. Uh, yes, hair length does matter. Um, does the passage give us any indication of what long hair, what constitutes long hair and what constitutes short hair? Um, it doesn't actually, it just says, you know, long hair, short hair. It doesn't tell us specifically what those lengths are. And so obviously there's the extremes we would want to avoid. A, a girl having a haircut like mine right now, a guy having a haircut, you know, that goes, his hair is down to his waist. Like obviously those are extremes where you, there'd be no debate. If I'm right, if this is, the Bible's really saying, uh, hey, gender roles, and, and we know this from our culture, gender roles, preserving gender roles is actually something that doesn't happen automatically in a culture that's in a wild rebellion to God, which is trying to reject gender roles and subvert them and and chop them into pieces and create lots of genders that don't exist. So hair length is actually a, a normal societal way of acknowledging the differences between God, uh, men and women that God has given. But how do you find the middle ground? Like where's is, where is too long? Like what if a guy's hair is just down to here, but it's, it's long on the top, but then he's trimming the back. What about a mullet? Mullets are coming back. Don't ask me why. I have no spiritual, you know, comment about mullets, but just, but just my cultural comment is, Ugh. <laughs> and so maybe you guys would join me in in a collective a collective groan that somehow mullets are coming back um, for the youth. But the uh, you know is is a mullet okay? Well, I mean, a mullet is known as a guy's hairstyle. This is true. So is that it's longer, but is it too long? I don't know how to answer that question. Um, the best answer I've heard when I was doing my research on the topic was from R.C. Sproul. And he simply said, um, hair length seems to change, you know, when you move from different times and seasons, even within a culture or across cultures. But what seems to be the general rule in most cultures is that hair is longer for the women and shorter for the men. And so you might look around your culture and ask, and this is very loose, but this is all I got for you. Um, is my hair length 
or the hair length of say Aragorn is that reflective of a of, of a man with a long, longer hairstyle, but it's still a guy's hairstyle, or a girl with with sh shorter hair. Which which one does it seem to reflect? And so in that, I would say there's there's a little bit of liberty and there's some looseness in, in my interpretation. But when I have gray areas, I don't approach them with a lot of strictness. I approach them with more looseness. So that would be a gray area. Um, Aragorn, my opinion, um, I never saw his hair and thought it looked girly. But he also didn't do it like a girl. So, I mean, I'm just giving you my gut reaction there. I'm not the one who gets to decide these things. So those are my opinions. Um, now, some would push back and say, but Mike... Some women can't grow long hair. Like they physically can't. Their hair breaks off. They can't grow it that long because of some genetic issue. Um, and some people suggest that there's whole groups of people where they, they just women can't grow their hair that long. And what I would just point out to them is understand the logic of the hair growth in 1 Corinthians 11. It's based on the idea that women can naturally grow hair longer. That's why it's seen as evidence that God wants them to. So any woman who doesn't naturally grow longer hair, there is no requirement for her to grow her hair longer because nature has not given her that. God has not equipped her with that. So there's no expectation there. So this rule would simply apply to most people, but not all people, because not everybody can grow their hair like that. Um, anyway, I'll move forward. I'm probably answering more than you're asking. <laughs> and for those who are confused, go check out my Women in Ministry uh, um, Part 10, where I deal with the head covering issue in incredible detail over, over six hours. Okay, number four. Or Beachwoods has a question. How is the good thief in Luke 23, 42 saved? It's interesting that you call him the good thief. I've never heard him mentioned as that. Uh, he died without knowing Jesus' resurrection. Jesus tells him, today you will be with me in paradise, but Christ doesn't rise for three days. Confused. Okay, totally understandable, confused. Let's look at the passage, Luke 23, 42. All right, this passage says, um, I'm going to back up just a little bit, okay? Um, and, and first, let's let's notice this, that uh, we know from other, um, one of the other Gospels, I don't remember which one right now, but one of the other Gospels, which tells us that these two thieves, uh, who, who it's a generic word for criminals, they were, they were some sort of horrible criminal that they would be getting crucified for it, right? Um, that, that seems fair to understand. And they both mocked Jesus when he was first on the cross. But of course, while Jesus was on the cross, a number of really amazing things happened. And during that time, seeing those amazing things happen, seeing the character of Jesus, this one of the thieves, one of the two, he has a change of heart and he turns to believe in Jesus. And so what does he do? Um, one of the, let's look at how, after he had his change of heart, how he reacts. So one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other that's who you're calling the good thief. I don't know if I call him good, but I know what you mean. Um, rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you were under the same sentence of condemnation? And let's look at what he says. And indeed, oh, on your screen. Sorry about that. And indeed, justly. that He says, we but we deserve to be crucified. You and me, we, we're not being wrongly killed by Rome. Like we are real bad criminals and we're getting what we deserve. For we are receiving the due reward of our of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What, what has just happened in these two verses is absolutely amazing. This thief recognizes he is a sinner who rightly deserves to die. Did you catch that? Talk about the gospel. And he then turns to Jesus and he acknowledges that Jesus is innocent which means that Jesus really was the prophet of God, really is the son of God. The thing he's, that he's accused of of being the king of the Jews, it's actually true. He is the king of the Jews. And then he acknowledges Jesus as king. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. So Jesus is king. He's, he has received ultimately as much of the gospel as was known at the time. He even believes that Jesus on the cross, even though he's dying, he's undefeated. This is some kind of work of God in the life of the thief. Like this guy has, in a sense, he's got more faith than the disciples right now who felt defeated upon the death of Jesus. This guy sees Jesus dying on the cross and he's, and he that's where he starts to believe in Jesus. I, I think he's the biggest light bulb moment in the gospel is the one who sees the cross as, um, see Jesus on the cross and there on the cross recognizes his messiahship. It, it's a beautiful and amazing thing. So how was he saved? He believed as much about Jesus as he had revealed to him. This is how Abraham was saved. Um, in Romans chapter 4, this is what you should read for homework, right? Romans 4, 
Abraham believed and was justified apart from works. He just believed God. Now, what did he know? He just knew that in his offspring, all the nations of the world would be blessed. He didn't really know all the details about Jesus, but God had spoken and he had trusted it and he put faith in God and that faith brought salvation. Um, and then later, of course, when Abraham heard more about Jesus, he immediately believed and received it because he'd already been believing Jesus. He just didn't know all the details yet. So this is how that guy was saved. Um, now, another question you kind of put in here is, why does Jesus say, today you'll be with me in paradise, but Christ doesn't rise for three days? Um, I think paradise seems like a fluid term to me. And this is my 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 thoughts on this. Um, I, I'm not 100% settled on it, but I think that paradise seems like a fluid term to me. It's not meant that paradise is one location that's always in one, or one, it's always in one location, but rather paradise is a happy, eternal experience, a happy after, I should put this, happy afterlife experience. And that location changed over time. In my opinion, my opinion, not all Christians agree on this. The location uh, before Jesus died on the cross was somewhere like down, or at least metaphorically down, and they would go and be in uh, Abraham's comfort, the same place Abraham went when he died. And they're being comforted by the, by the father of faith, Abraham. And so this guy is going to be in that happy location. When Jesus dies, then that location changes and it goes into the presence of the father because now Jesus has made the way. So they're not waiting on the Messiah to, to come. He has come and he leads them free into the presence of the father. So then in Revelation or in, in 2 Corinthians, when Paul talks about dying, he's like, hey, I'm going to be in the presence of God, not in this just happy place in the presence of, say, Abraham or others who had faith when they died. I'll be in the very presence of God because Jesus has made the way. So paradise has changed places, but it's the experience of the happy afterlife that paradise is talking about. That's my that's my current thinking on that. The thief went with Jesus into that location. Uh, he died that day to preach to those souls who had already been waiting on Christ and already d died, and even even those probably who'd rejected Christ. Read about read, read, you can read about that in First Peter. I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm talking, I'm sharing too many things, aren't I? It's too, getting too complicated. But um, but then that thief would have been taken with Jesus along with the rest into the presence of the Father now that the way had been made. That would be my my current understanding on that um, and my answer to you. So let's look at number five. Andy Williams says, how do you talk to someone who claims Christian faith, so they claim to be a Christian, but hates people groups because they are, quote, haters of God and denied Jesus? friend won't talk to me because I don't hate evil people enough. Okay, um, Andy, I'm going to have to guess a little bit because there seems like there's probably, like if, if I had you eye to eye, I would ask you a bunch of questions to understand your situation a lot better. But let me just talk about the issue of hating a group of people because they are, quote, haters of God and denied Jesus. I mean, I'm thinking he's talking about Jewish people here uh, because that type of rhetoric is usually used related to Jewish people. Um, it's a little difficult because at that point the people I've seen who've had this kind of attitude and I've seen it towards Muslims too right like uh, Muslims uh, Arabs you know they you 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 don't even bother preaching the gospel to them there's no point because you know of all these things I have all these conclusions about them that show that there's no point um I think what I would want to do is point them to the book of Jonah because while this attitude like a Christian could have towards, say, Jewish people today, this is an attitude that Jewish people had towards Ninevites back then. And it, it wasn't just that Ninevites were haters of God because they were idolaters, but it was also that the Ninevites had honestly done horrible, horrible things to the Jews, horrible things to them. And so they had a lot of bias against them. So that Jonah, in the, in the passage where Jonah is called to go speak to the Ninevites and give them an opportunity to repent, Jonah doesn't want to tell, give them a chance to repent. He wants them to die and suffer for their sins, and they deserve it. But God is a God of mercy and love. So Jonah goes the other way. He flees, he flees into the ocean to go the opposite direction away from Nineveh. Long story short, he ends up still there. When the people repent and God doesn't judge them, he's then pouting and he's really upset. And he's upset about his, 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 this gourd, this plant thing that has risen up and given him shade and then died right away. And he's all mad about it. And God's using it as an analogy. He's like, you're more upset about this plant than you are about the lives of those people. Um, what I would say is go to maybe the story of Jonah and, and ask him, what was wrong with Jonah's mentality? 
Just tell him, what, what do you think was wrong with Jonah's mentality towards the Ninevites? What do you think it was? Or maybe take them to Romans 11, where Paul talks about the Jewish people in the future receiving the Messiah and how he has this great hope for them. Or look at Paul the Apostle, who was persecuted by the Jews, who was one of the Jews who rejected Jesus, and then he gets saved, right? Now he's persecuted by them. Now they're attacking him. Now they hate him. And in Romans, I think it's Romans 10, he's like, um, I, I could wish that I myself was accursed for the sake of my brethren. I, I wish that they knew Jesus. Let me let me just say this. What do you think Paul's attitude was towards Jews, towards this, this people group who I think your friend despises? Look at Romans 10. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. He did not give up on them. In Romans 11, he talks about how there will be a future revival of the Jewish people. Long story short, let me say this. There is nobody, there is no group of people that Jesus didn't die for. And it is it is a huge, horrible error, Old Testament and New Testament, to try to take a group of people and assign them the label God-haters, irredeemable, because it is exactly those kinds of people that God makes an example of to show his mercy. So I would say that you're, 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 maybe those are some things you can you can talk to your friend about. I, I hope that it would help. Let's look at the next question. Uh, number six, Patrick Schmidt says, what is the meaning of the 12 and seven baskets left over from the feeding of the 5,000 and 4,000? Um, you know, Patrick, I got into some of this, I think, when I did my Mark series, going through the Gospel of Mark. And so when I did the feeding uh, the teaching on the feeding, we talked about some of that and symbolism in it. I'm, I believe in the symbolism of numbers in the Bible, but I believe in it um, cautiously so that I don't just say, let's just say I've seen a lot of reckless attitudes towards this stuff where it ends up feeling like just confirmation bias. It's like this number means this. I've even seen in, in a resource that's meant to just give you the meaning of all the numbers in the Bible where they'll interpret seven to mean one thing in one passage and seven means something else in a different passage. So I think that that can be a problem. Um, the, the the baskets that are left over, the numbers of them, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's interesting that if with 12 baskets left over, each of the disciples has a whole basket of bread. Uh, they've given away all of their, all of the bread they had, which wasn't any, in a sense. They, uh, they spent the whole time giving away bread and they still had a whole basket left each. Maybe it's just about the overabundance of God's provision. Maybe it's saying that Jesus is enough for all the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, seven is, you know, you could say seven is a number of completion. The thing is that a lot of these answers can fit, but unless you have something in the passage that gives you a clue that that is the right answer, I would just I would just put a big label, speculation. It doesn't mean it's wrong, just it's speculation. So you can speculate these numbers if you want. Seven could be the number of rest. You know, if you, you know with, with Jesus, when you've, when you've received Christ, you can then rest. 12 could be the number of completion. 12 could be the, 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 there's 12 months in a year. So this is the culmination. This is the final message of God is Jesus Christ, right? I could just assign meanings so easily that I, I feel a little hesitant to do so. So I'm not sure. Worth speculating. Someone else could probably answer that better than me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, number seven, Lonesome Warrior says, due to work, I'm not able to go to church. Should I look for another job so I can maintain fellowship? Or should I just continue with the job I have now? Due to work, I can't go to church. Um, look for another job? Seems like a smart move. I mean, it, it seems like, you know, with, with just this info in your life, uh, why not look for another job? Seems like in a lot, some, some job markets are actually really wide open. You might find a better job, better situation. I think if you teleport future to, to your future self 10 years from now, and you're like, yeah, now, for 10 years, I haven't been part of church. I wasn't able to bless others. I wasn't able to be part of it. Maybe maybe your family, kids, wife, or, or husband, they're not their part of it either. And then you have to ask yourself if that was a wise decision, a wise situation to put yourself in. Um, you know, there's maybe other options. Maybe you could fellowship at church and it's just not on Sunday mornings. Maybe there's a Saturday gatherings. Maybe there's like Saturday morning groups that you're getting. Either, I'm not saying there's no other ways to fellowship, but with a little info you've given me, why would you not look for a better job? that gives you more flexible hours and lets you be more involved with the body of Christ. Because I, I just want to say as a, as a Christian, it's really easy to, what two things happen at church, I think, can happen to us is 
we we look at church as an attendance thing and not an involvement thing. That's one big mistake we make. We treat it as attendance. And they'll let you because they're not forcing you to do things. You just show up and that's it. All you do is attend. I'm not building relationships. I'm not serving in some sense. I'm not connecting in some way with the body of Christ for accountability and for mutual building each other up and to express gifts and receive them, um, spiritual gifts. Instead, I just literally attend and then leave. Um, and there can be seasons where that kind of happens more in your life, but is a permanent thing that doesn't seem healthy at all. The second thing we've got going on is because we're so disconnected already with just an attendance mentality, when we stop going, we feel like we're not missing much. Um, and, and the truth is you were, you were already missing a lot and you just didn't know it because you were just merely attending. And so then you, you're left, you know, with this void in your life where you're like, I'm not going to church, but you know, I don't really feel all, it's all that much different than it was. And it's like, no, you were already hurting now and you've just cut off the last piece of the lifeline in your life. I'm just saying church is a really important thing. There's nowhere where Paul planted the gospel that he didn't form congregations of people to gather together to reinforce the gospel, to put elders there, to teach the word of God to people, to build each other. There's nowhere where the gospel goes out where churches aren't planted as a result. You're supposed to be in church. It's, it'd be my encouragement to you. It's actually a big, big deal to the Lord. And if it's not a big deal to you, it's probably because you've been attending but something, or maybe you've maybe you've been in a really unhealthy environment. Something's wrong. Something's not happening right. I'd say fix that, get it right, get it healthy, and then you will see and feel the value of it again. Let's go to question number eight. Um, this is Opal Lynch who says, "Please explain why the New Apostolic Reformation is unbiblical." Um, well, the you know what I'm I'm gonna do. I, I well, I'll do more stuff on this in the future, in the distant future, because it's nowhere even on the radar right now. But. Um, so the the new the NAR the New Apostolic Reformation seems to me to be a real thing, and a thing that um, is is really concerning. Um, but I don't I don't call them all like false brethren or kick them out of the body of Christ, so to speak. And I'm, I get a lot of heat for that. Um, um, but that's for another question, I guess. But but there is dangers in it, and there are certainly false brethren in the midst in the mix. Right, and I would imagine the 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 more involved you are in leadership in a group that has really big problems, the more concern we should have about your own standing. Not that it's really our our role to discern everybody's standing before Christ, um, in you know by just evaluating what we see from a distance. But but some of the concerns I'd have for you and me if we encounter a church that has espoused some of the NAR terminology and beliefs is the um, the belief in new. Um, I would say new revelation, and it really is kind of new revelation, but this sort of constant push for prophecy, new prophecy, new words of God, and then lowering the bar. And even groups that don't officially call themselves NAR, and I don't call them NAR, they still have some of these issues, like Bethel, where they lower the bar for what counts as prophecy. They encourage everyone to prophesy. They say, don't worry about it if you get it all wrong. Let's just receive everything as if it's from God. This creates a place where false prophecy would be rampant and there would be no controls. Uh, the way they would test prophecy, for instance, would be to, to say uh, prophecy has to be encouraging, it has to be uplifting, you can't give people bad news, it can only be good news. Like these are completely unbiblical rules. <laughs> it's not, there, though, though the Bible talks about, you know, speaking a word being edifying, it doesn't say only ever edifying. You know, it can also bring conviction. I mean, just look at the statements in Scripture that are prophetic. Um, they, they come in all stripes. These rules aren't about finding authentic prophecy. They're about creating an environment where people can feel free to make stuff up, I think. I, I hate to say it, but I've documented this more in my video I did on Bethel and Bill Johnson. So that's one of the NAR issues. Another NAR issue is the authority structure. Um, trying to create this sort of category of apostles that are like the... They, they have like uber power. It's like they have not just sort of the authority of an elder in a church, but they have like really next level authority, which doesn't even exist in the body of Christ. And they have more authority. And um, others are supposed to be under these apostles and receiving from them to get their blessings. And this creates a, a power situation that's unhealthy in the body of Christ, I believe. Um, there's more on this. You guys could look at um, Holly Pivik just came out with a book. I haven't read it yet, okay? I'm just telling you, here's something you might consider looking into. They just came out with another book, and I'm trying to find the name of it really quick. Holly Pivik and Doug Guyvet, I think it is. Um, 
um, just came out with a book called Counterfeit Kingdom. And it's going to get into a lot of those issues. They actually quote some of my work on the Passion Translation. And um, oh, how weird. When you go to the book page on Amazon, it's like, not there. Okay, this other link works. Counterfeit Kingdom, The Dangers of New Revelation, New Prophets, and New Age Practices in the Church. So if you just type Counterfeit Kingdom book, it just came out. Haven't read it yet, but I, I saw the chapter they did on the Passion Translation. Um, they got my feedback before they published it. So that will probably give you more stuff to, to be concerned about. I think my concern with those of us who interact with the NAR or, or those who are similar to the NAR, but they're not under that umbrella technically, is just that we accurately portray them, accurately understand the issues that are there, and then we can confront them openly and lovingly. And there are many, many, many in the discernment community online, and I would consider myself part of that too, like I do discernment stuff, who um, their views are the test of you being faithful to Jesus is how quick you are to exaggerate, overblow, and overreact to every single little mistake everyone makes. <laughs> and, and I mean, that just happens. That's not all the discernment community, but that is one of the one of the errors. It's 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 like to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, to some discernment people, everything looks like heresy. And we need to find that balance where there's wisdom. We're, we're bold and uncompromised, but we have wisdom as well. Um, I, I guess I could talk about that for a while because you, you guys have seen too, and, and you you know you need to use your own discernment on these things as well. But but I've been really raked over the coals by some people because I I don't call Joel Osteen a, a, a hellbound individual, even though I literally just have made content just to expose major major problems with his teaching and hopefully decrease his influence in people's lives. Right, like that's my goal here. But but I won't say I'm certain he's going to hell, <laughs> and so because of that. Um, I'm I'm being raked under the coals by these certain discernment groups. Now, don't take your, uh, don't think that what I'm saying here is if you like me, you can't like those guys. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this: here's a guy, Joel Osteen, that as far as I know, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong, uh, holds to the gospel. Right? He doesn't teach it well. He doesn't communicate it well, and he doesn't communicate it consistently. So his teaching is not promoting the gospel of Christ. That's the big issue I have. But his personal views do seem to support the gospel of Christ. And so I'm going to say, yeah, he seems to think that these things are accurate and true. So I'm going to I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say maybe he's just what First Corinthians or is it Second Corinthians describes as the believer who uh, I know I'm rambling here, but I'm tired. This is what I do when I'm tired. Second uh, Corinthians talks about the believer who all their labor they put into all the building they do in the church ends up being burned up because it was wood, hay, and stubble. Well, that's what I think Joel Osteen probably is, is a lot of his ministry is just going to be burned up and wiped away in judgment day, but maybe he himself will be saved because he holds to the gospel. Um, camera's blurring in and out, huh? Is that, is that a little better? All right. Hopefully it was. So, um, uh, my encouragement is yes, find the dangers of the AR, but, but, but watch out that you don't become just conspiratorial and paranoid and you're interacting wisely on those issues. Um, many churches who you would call NAR would never use that term to describe themselves, so maybe don't. Maybe maybe just say you have a, an apostolic signs and wonders thing going on that is unbiblical. All right, number nine. Um, yeah. Uh, number nine, Worldviews Collide says, does Revelation 22, 17 mean that we have a choice to stay in heaven? The last sentence specifically. Would we be able to blink out of existence? Would this offend God? Revelation 22, 17. Well, what an interesting question. Let's see what passage you are thinking of. And we'll put it on screen. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the, th the one who's thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. So your, your implication is, that, hey, maybe there's those of us who can simply choose not to take the water of life and to just cease existing, and maybe God would be okay with that. Um, it seems as though you're asking, if I'm understanding right, if a Christian who believes in Jesus and makes it into heaven, um, and they're part of the resurrection here in Revelation, and in 22, they've been, they've been brought back into uh, an eternal, uncorrupt body, they get to say, you know, I think I just want to sort of disappear. And maybe you even feel that way. I don't doubt that the psychology of even some Christians would have them going, I think I'd rather just stop existing. Um, I just want to say is that psychologically, you've got so much weird stuff going on. You think that's true. There's no way you would think it at that moment. 
There's no way you would think it at that moment. Well, now that I'm in total joy and happiness, total peace and great understanding about all of what's gone on in life, incredible, overwhelming, overflowing capacities of joy just being maxed out, I think I'd rather stop existing. Like, that's not going to happen. It may feel that way now, but your feelings are just wrong. That's the good news. Feelings are wrong all the time. Um, but this verse definitely is not about that. The people in this passage who are being appealed to to come and drink the water of life is everybody who hears the book of Revelation after they've after they've read all the stuff that's coming, they know the kingdom's coming, and then it's an appeal for salvation. It's telling the unsaved to come and get saved. It's not telling the saved that there's a moment of decision where they decide whether they'll stay in existence or not. It's telling the unsaved to get saved. Come, you're thirsty, come. God wants you, God loves you. Unlike the guy who thinks, they're just God haters, forget them. No, no. That's right, they're God haters. And God says, come, come, I will make you my friends, you who are my enemies. I will die for you, you who are killing me, so that you might come and freely drink the water of eternal life. That would be the context of that passage. So it's just not about um, a decision Christians make. It's a decision non-Christians make to actually become a Christian. Let's go to the next question. That is number 10. Owen Reynolds says, if Adam and Eve didn't have knowledge of good and evil, how would they know it's wrong to disobey God and to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Um, oh, and I totally understand what you're saying here. Um, it doesn't really make sense if we think that Adam, like, and Eve literally couldn't understand the concept of wrongness or rightness. Because how would they have known when God says, don't do that, how, how would they understand that that's something you should not do? You should, there's a, there's an ought that's there. Um, I think this is because we might be oversimplifying the term knowledge of good and evil. It just doesn't mean they simply had awareness that there was something right to do, something wrong to do. It was. It seems to me to be something deeper than that, something bigger than that. And I, I struggle to define it personally because I want to say maybe it's um, the, I guess what I lean on is saying it's the experiential knowledge because this is me trying to wrap my little brain around it. The experiential knowledge of doing right and wrong, knowing it more intimately, um, before you ever stole anything when you were a kid, you knew what stealing was, perhaps, depending on how old you were, but you hadn't actually done it. Once you had stolen, now you knew what stealing was. You get what I mean? This is an experiential thing that's in a different fashion. You know, like there's those of us who know war because we know about it, we've heard about it, and so we understand concepts of it, but then there's those of us who've gone through it, been in war, and you know it in an entirely different way. And so Adam and Eve knew sin. They knew good and evil in a new way. And that changed them. And this spoiled them. And that's how I take that knowledge of good and evil. But then you have to explain how does God have that knowledge? If it's an experiential knowledge of good and evil, and this is where I struggle, then how do you explain that God's the one who has that knowledge of good and evil as well? Because he says they're going to be like us knowing good and evil. I think the thing is that the, the knowledge of good and evil that God has with his omniscience, he knows, all, always knows what, what it's like for you to sin, for you to go through those things. He knows the intimacy of the difficulties of, say, war or evil, but they haven't spoiled him. These things haven't spoiled him. Um, God has that knowledge in full. They lacked it from human perspective. They don't have omniscience. And when they got it by sinning, it spoiled them. That's my best explanation. I'm sure that others might be able to handle that better. But yeah, I think we we obviously need to not just take it as pure awareness of right and wrong, or else how is there any accountability for them doing wrong if they had no knowledge of what was right or wrong? I think that would be taking it too strictly. So let's look at 11. Daniel Binkley says, what are your thoughts on declarative prayer or positive confession? For example, I declare revival for the city. I declare that this day is blessed. Grateful for you and your ministry. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I'm a little torn on it. I want to say, part of me, the, the conservative part of me, the theologically conservative part of me wants to say, yeah, you don't do that. Don't do that. Because you're just, you're being presumptuous. You're making statements that you don't know are true. Um, and another part of me sees things where, you know, where like Paul says and writes to, to, to an epistle, he says, you know, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And God is able to supply all your needs, he says to them. 
So there are those kinds of statements, but they seem to be t given with more caution in scripture than I see them being given when people declare things like today will be blessed. Today I, I will I will do well. God will be glorified in in this specific way in my life. Like it's fine to say today God will be glorified. That I find totally fair to declare that out because that's a blanket truth that's simply true all times and I can delight in it. To say that God is able to provide all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus and and he even will provide them all. But it's something else to say God will provide you with a car. <laughs> Because that feels presumptuous. So if you remove the presumptuousness, but it's still a statement of faith declaring things that are ironclad true in Christ and not just hopeful. Um, but there's one situation where, personally, I would be totally supportive of someone declaring something specific, like about uh, a venture, a job opportunity, uh, an experience, something that they're hoping for, and they're like, God's going to grant me this. And that is when the Holy Spirit has revealed to them that this is something God's going to do for them. And then they can simply trust it. Now, this is kind of what Abraham did, right? I don't see him doing a declarative thing, but what he did is he he built altars and right and then dug wells. <laughs> These are things that him and his family did because this was their way of saying, this land will be ours. It will be. Not now, but it will be in the future. And they trusted in that. And they had that kind of like bold faith that others would look and be like, yeah, you're being kind of presumptuous. But they weren't because God had revealed to them this was in fact what he was going to do. So this is like a positive thing. You know, when they shouted for the walls of Jericho to fall down, that wasn't presumptive because they were responding to something God clearly told them to do. So if the Holy Spirit reveals to you that God's going to bless you with this job or God's going to going to do some something, I think your example was, um, let's see, we're on um, 11. So here you are. Uh, I declare revival for this city. If the Holy Spirit has revealed to you that God's going to bring revival to the city, then you can't absolutely declare that. But absent the revelation of God, I would rather pray, God can revive this city. Let's pray that he does. And that, that would be, to me, the balance. Okay, let's look at question number 12. Uh, Boy Ski Finance and Stuff says, should Christians boycott businesses paying for abortion travel? Um, hmm. I struggle with how to answer this question because boycotts aren't a black and white thing for me. Um, if it's black and white, and what I mean by that is if I'm supposed to boycott every business that's supporting things I, I think are wrong, then I have two questions about that. One is, give me a list of business, businesses I can still buy from, right? Because you need to now look into all of them <laughs> and see all the things they're doing that are wrong. And you need to then give me the ability to say I can shop at Winco or I can shop at Walmart or I can shop at, or maybe to grow my, all my own food now, um, which is difficult in Southern California because you do not have land. <laughs> um, so that's one difficulty is I, I need that list now. Um, it seems people just do it sort of roughshod. Like they go, Starbucks did what? Never, never shop in there again. What Disney did what? Oh, never, never going to see their stuff again. Oh, but they aren't actually looking to see who's doing this sort of thing beyond just a couple examples that sort of whack-a-mole pop their heads up. And I'd want to be consistent. Um, now, for those who are boycotting Disney, I actually, that's one of the more extreme examples. I probably shouldn't have put them out there. They are calling for it in a lot more ways than a lot of other people are, for sure. Um, so the other issue I have is this. Um, in the letters to the Corinthians, Paul deals with the issue of meat sacrificed to idols. So these are businesses that are buying meat in the marketplace. They're, they're getting meat, buying them from suppliers. They offer the meat to idols and then they sell it in the marketplace. So they're selling meat sold to idol, offered to idols in the marketplace to Christians. And Paul has a nuanced approach to this. And he goes, well, you know, don't even ask where the meat came from, right? Like, but if, but if they're making a thing about it, if they're like putting it in your face, hey, this meat came from idols. This is my paraphrase of his teaching. If the meat, the meat's been offered to idols, then, then walk away, then walk away. But if, if they're, if it's just like not in your face, like you're not, it's not being, and the reason why it's not, in, not in your face matters is because it doesn't involve your, uh, support or any sort of, any sort of implication that you are participating in this thing. It's something they did, but it, you're not doing. And so I think this might be the balance on boycotting. It's like, the question is by me participating in whatever, buying this product or using this service, am I also in some way socially am i participating in the bad thing they're doing with the money they're getting and if the answer is yes then 
it's time to separate yourself from that thing. And if the answer is no, then you separate, you are already separated because it's what they're doing, but you're, let me give you an example of where I think this crosses the line. I go to a movie theater and I pay money to support the new Disney movie, which I've only heard reports on. So if the reports are accurate, it's like um, really bad. It's something bad for children to watch and it promotes ungodliness and and stuff like that. As far as the, the strange world, I think it's called. Um, if I go to the movie theater and pay money, I'm directly rewarding this business product that has wickedness in it, like this specific product. You see how that that involves me more in the thing. Now, what if I just subscribe to Disney Plus? Well, now I have a broad subscription to a large number of products that they produce, and they'll only find reward or association with me in a product when I watch that specific thing. So if I don't, if I avoid certain shows and watch other shows, I'm actually sending positive feedback and not rewarding them for the bad stuff they've done. So I see there as being nuanced to these issues. Uh, okay, let me read your question again and then answer it more straightforwardly now. Should Christians boycott businesses paying for abortion travel? Um, first off, I don't even know how to do that because I don't know which businesses are doing that. Um, but secondly, um, if the business is forefronting this paying for abortion travel, if they're pushing it and, and it's becoming part of their business identity in the public, then I'm more inclined to say yes. And if they're not, if it's behind the scenes, then I'm thinking that this is less, less on me, just like the meat sacrifice to idols that I haven't been told about my current view. I'd love to hear your guys' feedback on this. This is a tough question. 13, Nate Haygood says, how much of the doctrine of the Trinity do we need to explain while sharing the gospel, especially when it comes to the hypostatic union? Oh yeah, you don't need to explain the hypostatic union when it comes to the gospel. Um, I think there are people who came to believe Jesus died and rose again for them, heard he was the son of God, didn't know what that meant, and were genuinely saved. It's, it's, you can be ignorant of the details of the Trinity and be saved. I think the problem is when you're openly rejecting them. And even then, I want to know what are you rejecting specifically? So are you like, I reject the deity of Christ. Okay, well, now you've denied like a core element of Jesus's very identity of what and who he is. So are you really believing in Jesus when you're obviously rejecting a core element of who he is? That's not real belief in Jesus, is it? So when it comes to the gospel, I'm mostly concerned with, um, Jesus, yeah, at least even in the Vegas sense, he's the son of God. Like, I just want to get that across. But I don't need to get into all the details. Time can allow for the ex explanation of these things in greater detail later. Yeah, that would be my, my short answer. Uh, number 14, Taylor Paris says, Is it clear in Old Testament prophecies that Jesus will come not only once, but twice? Thanks, Mike. Um, th that's a big question because Old Testament prophecies is this massive, massive category. So is it clear? Um, I don't know if it's clear. I don't know what you mean is clear. It's there. I would, I would say it's there. It's definitely there. Is it clear? You know, the, the Jews in Jesus' time had a theory about this. They, they actually had the two Messiah theory because they saw passages that talked about the Messiah suffering and dying. And they saw passages that talked about him ruling and reigning and, and like ruling over the world. And so they were like, yeah, well, maybe there's two messiahs. One of them dies, one of them rules. You see how they were, so that it was obviously not, it wasn't clear that there was only one coming. Maybe I could put it that way. It was not clear there was only one coming. It may not have been clear there were two comings, but there was a lot of data that, that made a lot more sense when you saw it in light of the first and second coming of Christ and the incorporation of the Gentiles into the kingdom. But we have things like, um, like David, King David, and this is typology here, so this is, I wouldn't call it clear. I would say in hindsight, you go, oh, and the light bulb goes on. Uh, King David, who um, uh, comes once and is rejected as king, and then later he comes and he's received. He's actually hunted when he's first revealed to be the anointed one, the king, and, and he's the type of the Messiah. And we have Moses who in the first attempt to deliver the people is rejected. And then he goes out and he does stuff among the non-believers, the Gentiles, and prospers there and then comes back and delivers the people. So that's interesting. And Jesus in his first coming was rejected, goes out and, and raises up the Gentiles. I mean, David did the same thing. He, he actually raised up an army while he was gone. Jephthah in the book of Judges, he's brought in um, or he's rejected by the Jewish people and he goes out and it says worthless men followed him. <laughs> And then later they need deliverance. And now him and the worthless men follow, following him, that's us, that's you and me, 
Um, they come and they deliver the Jewish people. So th this is, does this clearly teach the first and second coming of Christ? No, no, but it's consistent with it. And the clarity comes more in hindsight, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think a, a, a more studied answer would be better, but there's some thoughts for you. All right, Conan Rose says, if a friend says they're looking for a religion that feels right, in quotes, how do, uh, how do I approach them if they've already left Christianity? I mean, this is such a tough question for me. People are so different and individual and relationships are so different. Some relationships, the best thing to do is you just tell them like, you're being a fool. What are you, you're being such a fool. You're literally just making stuff up to make yourself feel good. How, how is that ever going to work in your life? Like, I mean, and maybe in some people, that's how you approach them. And maybe somebody else, you just go, what do you mean feels right? What didn't feel right before? And you just start doing like a million questions to try to pull it all out of them. I don't know the right answer here because people are so different and relationships are so different. Um, let me just point out some problems that I would at least be trying to pay attention to. Some issues I would try to address as I'm watching them and they're watching me and I know our relationship. And some of the issues I want to address is this. They already left Christianity. Why? That's that's important. Why did they leave? Another question I would want to ask them and find out about if they, if they would share it with me is what Christianity did they leave? Because I would strongly suspect that when they describe the Christianity they left, they will get it wrong. And that gives you a chance to just listen for a while and then say, let me tell you about the Christianity I have, which is different than the one you left. That could be an open door if that's a fruitful avenue of, of questions. What is the Christianity you left? Is it even really Christianity? Um, and then they want something that feels right. And then I would want to explore perhaps what is it that would feel right to you? Like if you could construct your ideal religion, what would that look like? Then after they've constructed it, you can critique or assess what is going on with this thing that feels good to them. And you can hopefully show the problems with it. Um, along with just, you know, I, I actually had a conversation with a guy not long ago and uh, actually over Thanksgiving, it was a family thing. And um, and he was just like a friend of the family kind of thing. I started telling me about who he was a former Jehovah's Witness and he had left the JWs. And now he, like many former JWs, he just feels... Like he can't believe anything. Um, he can't wholeheartedly believe anything because he doesn't want to be under the control of anybody. And so he started forming his own sort of beliefs. He goes, I just think this and that and this and that. And um, I asked him what he did for a window for, for a living. And he told me it was like did a window window installation. And so I gave him an analogy. I, I thought maybe this would help me. I don't know if you'll benefit from this in some way with your conversations. I said, let's suppose that you went to somebody who wanted windows. And you were like, well, there's there's this way and that way and there's a right way and a wrong way and all that. And they go, I don't want to do any of that. I just want, you know, I just want to do it my own way. Whatever feels right to me. I'm going to install it myself and just put my own windows in and whatever feels good at the moment. Like I'll push this one out. I'll put this here. I'll glue it this way or I'll use these materials. You would, you would be very worried about that person, right? And he goes, yeah, I'd be really worried about him. I said, well, that's how I feel about you right now. You know, this is, you're literally creating your own religion to fit your own desires in a very reckless fashion. You're basically guaranteed to make it wrong, but you'll like it. That's that's just what self-delusion looks like. I understand what it feels like to leave the JWs in particular. You're, you're so, you've been so messed up by this group that you're afraid to trust anybody. And so it feels good to just trust yourself and not look to anybody to be sort of guiding you and directing you. But, re but real religion, true religion is not invented, it's discovered. You don't invent it to fit yourself. You discover what's true. Like if it's really there, it's discovered, not invented. That's a huge difference. So anybody that's going for the religion that makes them feel good is going for the thing that they can in ultimately invent. Find pieces of this and pieces of that to make me feel good. They're guaranteed to get it wrong, but they'll be in heavy delusion because it just it serves them well. You know, that's just not how reality works. And so we got to do the hard work of praying and seeking the Lord and looking for the discovery of who he really is. And so I encouraged this person to just really read the, the Bible apart from the Jehovah's Witness teachings, just read the scriptures. Um, and then we had a conversation about Bible translations because that's the Jehovah's Witness had brainwashed him about that stuff too. All right, number 16, Kitty Lancaster says, after a believer dies, will they remember their loved ones who were unbelievers? I understand perfect peace, but that does not answer the question. Hmm. 
But, but that does answer the question. I don't know. I don't know if you meant does or doesn't answer the question there, Kitty. But so after, uh, will I remember my unsaved loved ones? Well, the only reason to say you won't remember them is because you feel that that's the only solution to the problem of grief. That would be the, the only reason I can think of because there's no scripture. Like if you're going to tell me that there's a whole, there's a bunch of holes punched in my memory in my life. Let's say that your, your mother is not saved. So you have lifelong memories about your mom. Are you saying those are all just punched out of your head? How much of my life is missing now? Let's say that the, you, you are a Christian amongst a majority of non-believers, that, of friends and acquaintances and family. Are you saying that huge swaths of your life are punched right out of your memory? Because that's the only way to deal with the grief of knowing that they are in hell or they are outside of the kingdom of God. So I, I, I would say this is what I'm suggesting here is I want us to understand the solution we're presenting for this grief is a big there's a big cost to it because I want to remember those people. Like even if they're unsaved, I want to remember them personally. I don't know why I would want to actually forget them. It also feels like an affront a bit to the justice of God to say, God, when you judge sinners, I will never be okay with it. And I will so not be okay with it that for eternity, I'd rather you wipe it from my memory than for me to try to reconcile that judgment with me thinking you're good or with me being okay with it even. Um, and so that this is a big cost. Like what I'm, I want us to show that this seems like a real sort of innocent thing, but when you really unpack it, you go, "Oh, there's a pretty there's a lot of stuff going on here." So, what will I do? Um, I think when we see God judging, we're going to not just see judgment from God; we're going to see the explanation of it personally. I think this is true. I will not only see God judging sin, but I will see sin for what it is. Now, th this happens sometimes. Uh, in our in our world, when somebody gets busted for doing some sort of really bad stuff throughout their life and suddenly everyone finds out about it. And then their neighbors are like, I thought he was a great guy. I thought he was such a nice person. I didn't know he was doing anything. And then you're like, over and over again, we've heard this from these, these people, like, oh, I didn't know. And of course, there were people scattered here and there who all knew about the horrible things this person was doing. But those who didn't really know about those sins, they had a much higher estimation of those people. When judgment happens and we can see sin revealed for how bad it is and how pervasive it is in the lives of others, it's going to change at least part of our perspective on God judging when we're going to go, yeah, God, you know, you should judge. Like, it's actually right that you judge. And perhaps you would know the times that they had heard the gospel, re received the opportunity to, um, to turn to Christ and rejected it. And you would see the justice and goodness of God in those things. What I'm saying is, Rather than thinking we will forget our loved ones and that's how we'll deal with our grief, maybe we will be reconciled to their to their judgments by understanding that this is something that God is doing that's good. He loves them too. This is their decision, their sin, and his righteous judgment that's being brought down. Now, you may say, I'm not okay with that right now, Mike. But I'm not saying you should be okay with it now. <laughs> this is important. I'm saying I think you will be okay with it then. I don't know how you argue against that. No, I won't. No matter what knowledge God gives me, no matter what understanding I get, no matter what clarity and what wisdom and what righteous revelations I get, I will never be okay with that. I think that's actually the wrong attitude to have. Have hope in your heart that right now you, you trust God to judge and you will respect his judgments, but there will be a future day where you, were act you will actually appreciate his judgments and you will see them for how good they are, not just as something that I guess God's going to have to do. You will actually respect and see how good the judgments of God are in that future day. Revelation 19 kind of might give us a bit of a, uh, a hint at this. Um, this is the verse that that actually um, I think of on this issue, kind of where my light bulb went off. Here, speaking about future judgment, it says, After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out. And here's what they're crying out. When? When God is judging. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. This is the future cry of those who in, in revelation of Christ, in revelation of God, and in revelation of the sin of man and the judgment of man, they go, wow, God, you were right all along. This was the right thing to do. I support it. And I think that that's a better thing to do than to think our memories are Swiss cheese. Okay, let's go to question 17. Uh, this is from XD Platypus, who says, why do some people have a, a gift of healing 
And it works when they pray for people, but I can't do the same. If we're praying to the same God, why does two people's prayers give different results? Um, so these are two, a couple different questions here. I mean, you know, in general, it makes sense to me that one person prays and then someone else prays and then that prayer is answered that, okay, well, there's all sorts of things that could be going on there. Remember when Jesus approached the disciples and they tried to cast the demon out of this boy and they tried and they had successfully cast demons out and then they tried this and it didn't work. And they go, why didn't it work when we cast, tried to cast out the demon? But you just said, be gone. And the demon was out. And Jesus says, this one only comes out by prayer or one, uh, trans one, one gospel says by prayer and fasting. And the two gospels read it slightly differently. The implication is that the same person could have, the disciples could have achieved their answers to prayer if they had simply prayed more, prayed more seriously, more fervently, uh, fasted along with praying. That's the implication. So there, there is actually, perhaps there's something going on there. Not about the person as much as the method. But is every prayer going to be answered like that? No, of course not. God can say yes. God can say no. Just like he wouldn't remove the thorn from the flesh of um, Paul or he allowed Epaphroditus to get sick and almost die. Um, and Paul the Apostle left him. And, and, and Paul the Apostle knew how to pray, right? But he, he left him sick instead of just praying for his healing. He obviously prayed. The guy didn't get healed. He accepted God's will and moved on. So another thing you say here, though, is um, let me read it again. Um, why do some people have a gift of healing and it works when they pray for people, but I can't do the same? Like if you know anybody who's got the gift of healing and you know someone who's sick, you should bring them to that person and have them pray for them. It's possible that what you know of is you know of people who by reputation in a certain charismatic circle have this sort of gift of healing, but all you ever hear are the, are the best stories they've got. They don't tell you the stories and show you all the stuff of when it doesn't happen. And so you overestimate the amount of healings that they're seeing. And then you think you're not seeing that. So you're, you're undervaluing your experience because you're overvaluing theirs. And I've seen this happen. So I'm just saying that's a possibility. But if you know someone like that, you're like, they got the gift of healing and my friends got, got cancer. I pray and pray. I mean, just like get that friend over to that person if that's what it takes. I, I mean, I would just do that and say, well, you know, maybe God has his reasons for why some people have gifts and others don't in particular areas. That's okay. He doesn't have to give the same gifts to everybody. It's not a competition. We're a body. You know, someone has the gift of teaching, someone else doesn't. When your friend has a question and you, you want that to be answered, you you point them to the person with the gift of teaching. And you're not like, why don't I have that gift? It, it, right? With gift of healings, it's different. It's like our ego can be wrapped up in it in some sense. Um, but I but I hesitate to think that people have the gift of healing like an ongoing permanent thing. Like they just go around healing people all the time. And that's a permanent situation as opposed to a temporary work of the spirit. I hesitate to think that that's the case. And if they do, um, then they should be they should be traveling more and visiting more hospitals. <laughs> so yeah, my thoughts on that, um, I, I hope that something I share there helps you, XD Platypus. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. All right, 18. Anonymous question says, we homeschool and one of the most popular Christian curricula happens to be from a Mormon. I keep going back and forth over it if I should use it because it's very solid academically advice. Is it dealing with religion? Um, if it's dealing with math, if it's dealing with others, if it, but if it's dealing with religion, if it's dealing with anything related to religion, I would be incredibly suspect of it, especially if it's a skilled teaching Mormon. Mormon is really good at teaching because they're going to embed Mormonism's current mode of operation, their current method of operation is to imitate Christianity, say we're Christian too, there's really no difference between us. But then they use the same words as Christians with different definitions of what those words mean. God doesn't mean God. Heaven doesn't mean heaven. Salvation doesn't mean salvation. Uh, you, you name it. Go on and on and on and on down the list. All these important words don't mean the same things in Mormonism. So they use the same words, but they have different meanings. So any Mormon source that's teaching religious things I would not at all put those in front of my kids or use those resources. If it's teaching math, history, unrelated topics, right? But if that history has a section on Joseph Smith, I'm like, <laughs> out the door. So that would be my, my answer to you. At least that's my gut answer. I'm just speaking to you as a brother who you're asking for his opinion, something for you to consider with a grain of salt. Um, yeah. Those are my thoughts. All right, number 19. This is from Kaylee Witten, who says, what's the difference between suppressing our emotions 
versus having self-control over our emotions. Hmm. I struggle to show positive slash negative emotions to God or others, and I seem to distrust God or others with my emotions. Gosh, Kaylee, I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer this. Um, I'm not sure how to answer this. Uh, the difference between suppressing emotions versus having self-control. Okay, well, the self-control part makes sense to me because it's just me saying, even though I feel one way, I will behave a different way. That's self-control. I'm going to behave in, in a right way, even though I'm feeling desires or emotions that are pulling me in a, in a bad direction. That's a great and godly and wonderful thing. I'll do what's right no matter how I feel. Um, but suppressing emotions or struggling to show positive or negative emotions to God and others, I'm not sure where that comes where that comes in and what is all causing that. I, I know that when I was a child, uh, personally, just speaking from my own life, I hesitated to open up to people or, or anybody. Um, and that was a habit I had developed over, over time for various reasons. And so being able to open up and be honest and stuff like that and sort of be real had more to do with for me, A, believing that that being honest about what I was going through might actually help, because I just believed it didn't, it wouldn't help anything. There was no point in telling anybody anything. Um, so believing that it could actually help, and of course choosing people, the right people to do that with. But but also, um, what was the other point I was trying to share? Um, yeah, the other element of opening up was, I think, insecurity or fear about being honest about what I was feeling or experiencing. And that insecurity or fear isn't like terror, it's just like a discomfort. Like, oh, it's just uncomfortable, it's uncomfortable to say that, do that. But I find that in prayer, when I work through my emotions with God, I, like, I talk to the Lord about the things that I'm experiencing, that that is a very helpful thing. And often, as I'm expressing those emotional things I'm going through with the Lord, that's when wisdom comes. The Holy Spirit seems to reveal things to me that are just like exactly what I needed to give me direction. And I don't think it would have come had I not opened up. And so like a verse for you on this um, is Psalm, one of my favorite verses is Psalm 62, um, verse eight. Let me put it on your screen. Where it says, trust in him at all times, O people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. The book of Psalms has tons of heart pouring that goes out that's beyond my skill to do, but, but I do try to pour my heart out to the Lord. So this is like a good thing to develop, especially in your relationship with God, is to pour your heart out to him. I think that we, we want to, though, even while we do that, even while I pour my heart out to God, I'm not letting my heart control my will. I'm simply expressing to the Lord the things I'm struggling with, the things I'm feeling, but I'm not making those things, I'm not giving those things a steering wheel of my life. Even as I express them to others, um, my will controls my actions, not my emotions, but my emotions are the things I'm going through and they do matter. Kaylee, I don't know if any of that that I just shared helps you at all. Um, man, I, I, I wish I was better equipped to answer that question, but um, I, I hope you found some benefit in what I, what I did share. And, and especially in that scripture that encourages you to learn the process of pouring your heart out before God. So question 20 is from Luke Handon. Luke, Luke or Luke and Don, I don't know, Luke Handon, says in the beginning of Genesis, it says, God rested on day seven, but considering no creation happens beyond day seven, did he technically rest for more than one day? Or am I misunderstanding something? Also, is it possible to ask you to pray for me? I'm getting baptized on Sunday and hope my unsaved friends and family turn to Christ when they watch. Um, oh, that would be sweet. We will definitely pray for that. So um, God rested on the seventh day. Let me tell you a funny story. One of my students years ago, okay, I'm not a youth pastor anymore. This is my full-time thing is just this online ministry mostly studying all day long um but but when i was doing youth ministry which i did for like 20 years i think uh, 13 years as a youth pastor uh one time a student came up to me and told me that in his bible club where they would meet us at, at, at on a on a you know public school campus in a high school and they would go to this bible club once a week and they had a guest pastor from some youth ministry locally and someone asked him why did god rest on the seventh day and the youth pastor said, yeah, he was tired. <laughs> just, that's just such commentary. <laughs> oh, 
on 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 uh, on the state of things. And um, and the kid came up to me and he was like, you know, he didn't interrupt the pastor when he was talking, right? He came to me afterwards, like that night when we had youth ministry, and he was like, "Is that right? That seemed kind of weird to me. Like God wouldn't get tired, would he?" And I was like, "No, I wasn't tired." He rested because he was done. That was it. He rested because he was done. So he rested on the seventh day. The seventh day then becomes iconic for this idea of resting from labor or being done with with labor. Um, both of those concepts, which are different, are both connected to that to that day. In the book of Hebrews, it talks about it too. In Exodus, that same idea of resting on the Sabbath is brought up, and the parallel is, hey, you guys will work six days. This is the under under the law, the commands to Israel. They're under the law. You will work six days. You will rest on the Sabbath. And if you don't, God's going to get pretty upset, actually. But you will rest on the Sabbath, but then they work six more days. So this was meant to be teaching a cyclical week. So there's a sense in which the seventh day represents rest, not every day after that, but the seventh day becomes a representation of rest. But God's creative work was basically done on the Sabbath um, or on in the six days. Jesus then brings us up again, and when he talks about working, um, uh, he shows that God's still working, even though he rested from creation's work, he's still working as in doing things in, in, in the world because he's challenged on uh, healing on the Sabbath in one of the Gospels, in John, I think it is. He heals on the Sabbath. Maybe it was the stretching out of the withered hand's man. The withered hand's man? The withered man's hand? Um, I'm getting a little loopy here, forgive me. So he heals on the Sabbath, and they're like, you know, you 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 shouldn't heal on the Sabbath. And he goes, my father's been working till now, and I'm working. But this wasn't labor like, like work labor, the stuff that Exodus is talking about, or the stuff that Genesis is talking about in days one through six. This was the work of God simply being active in creation and doing things. Jesus healed someone on the Sabbath. But he implied God had been working. So even though creation's work was done, God's still active. He doesn't, it's not deism where he just bails from creation and lets things go and doesn't interact. It's God interacting still with creation. Okay, all that to say, let's reread your question again. Um, considering no creation happens beyond day seven, he didn't, did, didn't he technically rest for more than one day? In a sense, yes. He rested as in it was all done. But the seventh day is the iconic day that represents rest from creation so that it was used later in the law to represent rest from work, from labor. Then in Hebrews, it's used to represent the ultimate rest of us entering into eternal glory, into the new creation in earth where we don't labor and there's no thorns and thistles, there's no difficulty and no pain, and we enter into the rest that God has for us in the eternal kingdom. So it represents more than one thing is what I would have to say, and I, I hope that answers your question. So Luke Andon, um, let's pray for you. Uh, you say you're getting baptized on Sunday and hoping your unsaved friends and family turn to Christ when they watch. Let, let's pray. Uh, Father, we lift up uh, Luke Andon, uh, whatever his name is in, in real life or her name. Uh, but we, we pray for uh, probably him that you would use his life as a light that would cause others to see. That they would uh, look at his life and, and go, it's, it seems like something's really happened between him and God. Like he's really encountered God. And they would see that. And they would see that connected not only to him, but connected to the gospel of Christ and connected to the church that he's going to be at. We pray that when they visit this church, when they see him getting baptized, wherever it takes place, that they would have the, the Holy Spirit reaching into their hearts and pulling them, saying, come, come, you who are thirsty, convicting them of their sin, making them aware of their need for Jesus, and just breaking them, Lord. May they sense that the doors of heaven are wide open to receive them if they will humble themselves at the foot of the cross. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all. I will be releasing the newest video on women in ministry. Um, like I said, probably Sunday. Um, just have a little tweaks I have to do on it. And we've just got two more after that. Then I'm done with that whole series. And I'm grateful because it's it's uh, too much work. <laughs> but I hope it brings great benefit to the body of Christ. That's the agenda. Anyway, that's all. Have a wonderful day. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.